Today we're going to be talking about the uh, concept of a blood covenant. We do an awful lot of unlearning things. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's just so much Hellenism that is inbred into our culture today that some of it we don't even think about. And if you pick up the commentaries, they're really filled with it and you don't even realize the Hellenism that's been slipped in there. You think the Maccabees lost the war. Uh, last week we talked about the full armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and how Paul is actually quoting from Isaiah. And so uh, each of the items of armor Paul talks about, he's quoting from Isaiah and also from the uh, apocryphal book of the Wisdom of Solomon. And so Paul isn't talking about a Roman soldier. He's talking about a ancient Hebrew soldier and it makes a world of difference because there's whole books that have been written on the full armor of God concentrating on details of, of allegory based upon ancient Roman armor and it wasn't ancient Roman armor that was being talked about. The same thing is true here of a passage that we're going to talk about today. It's a passage that is just filled with Hellenistic understanding to an extent that it's a, a portion of Hellenism that's just become such a part of our daily lives that we don't even think about the fact that it's just not universally uh, universal culture. The, uh, the misunderstood passage is Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 16 through 17. For where there is a, and I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version here, <clears throat> for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power and all, at all while the testator lives. Okay, what does this mean? What is the testament being talked about here, and what is Paul comparing, what is Paul's concept here? If you pick up, pick up a commentary, it will almost certainly tell you, in fact, you'll notice that the translator switches to the word testament here instead of the word covenant. And if you pick up a commentary, it will almost certainly tell you that this passage is talking about the concept of a last will and testament. And we know what a last will and testament is. You write down on a piece of paper, I, James Trim, being of sound mind and body, leave all of my worldly goods to Robert Tilton or something. <laughs> Not. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> this is the Roman Hellenistic concept of inheritance. If I'm going to die in the Roman Hellenistic culture that we live in today, I write out a piece of paper before my death comes to tell people what to do with my goods, what my inheritance, uh, how, how my inheritance should work out. Completely foreign to Jewish culture, at least ancient Jewish culture. In ancient Jewish culture, in ancient Hebrew culture, when a person dies, their firstborn inherits a double portion, their other sons inherit an equal portion thereafter, and they can write on a piece of paper all day long, it won't change a thing about what happens when they die. The idea of a last will and testament is completely contrary to Jewish thought. It's completely contrary to Torah. And it has nothing whatsoever to do with anything Paul would be talking about. But we are so used to the idea that inheritance has to do with a last will and testament, and our own mindset, because our law today descends from ancient Roman law, that we have bought into, we've been sold a bill of goods, we've bought into the idea that this passage is somehow is talking about last, last will and testament. Now it sounds like it when you read it. When you read this passage, it sounds like it's talking about a last will and testament, especially if you're coming from our cultural standpoint. Well, read it, I'll read it again one more time and just think about how much this does sound like a last will and testament. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, 
since it has no power over them while the testator lives. Now, it sure sounds like a last will and testament to me, okay? Especially, you know, being born and raised in the USA. The concept being talked about here is a completely different concept, and that is the concept in Hebrew thought, in ancient Hebrew thought, of a blood covenant. And the way a blood covenant worked, it was the most, it was the most um, strong commitment two people could make to, to each other. And the, the concept of a blood covenant was very ancient. In fact, if we go back to the earliest Jewish halakhic sources we have, the Mishnah and whatnot, uh, even the writings of Josephus, we have nothing of the customs associated with making the ancient Hebrew blood covenant. Nothing preserved because the, the, whole, the whole practice had fallen out of practice before the first century. The, they still knew what the idea was because it's in the scripture and I'll show you momentarily some examples in the Tanakh of people taking what we call a blood covenant. It's actually just called a covenant. I use the term blood covenant because that's the, the term that's used today to describe this whole concept. Now, you, the concept of a blood covenant is virtually universal. There's about three things that you can find that, that anthropologists will find in any culture on Earth, no matter how far removed, uh, in the deepest jungles of the Amazon, uh, anywhere on Earth, they'll always find generally three things. They'll always find civilizations that believe in God of some kind. They have yet to ever come upon a tribe of atheists living in the back jungles of the Amazon. There is a natural tendency to believe in God. Two, the practice of animal sacrifice is, all, is almost universal, if not universal, in every culture, no matter how far removed. And three, the concept of a blood covenant. It's an ancient Hebrew concept. I'm going to talk about the ancient Hebrew concept but you go into Africa and African tribes, they take blood covenants. When our founding fathers came over here onto this continent, they found American Indians that were taking blood covenants together. Every civilization has had this concept. It seems to go back a long way. Now, a blood covenant, the way it worked is that if I was to take a blood covenant with Eric, I would become a member of Eric's house. Eric would become a member of my house. We would become essentially brothers. I would f put Eric's interests above my own, and Eric would put his interests above, would put my interests above his own. <laughs> Some friend you are. <laughs> Eric would put my interests above his own. And if anybody attacked my house, for example, I, could, I would know that I could call on Eric, and Eric's, Eric and his house would would uh, come to our aid. If I was in a fight in, in town or something, I knew Eric was right there, and Eric was going to, to fight by my side to the death. It was taken very, very seriously. So seriously that guess what? If Eric died, I got an equal inheritance with his brother, with his, uh, uh, as part of his inheritance. I inherited because I was part of his house. This is the concept Paul is talking about now. If you reread it and you read it with the word covenant instead of testament, <clears throat> you'll see that Paul is talking about the concept of a blood covenant. I'll reread it that way. For where there is a covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the covenantor, for a covenant is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the covenantor lives. So the concept Paul is talking about is the concept of taking a blood covenant and becoming a member of somebody's house and therefore having an inheritance. It is not a last will and testament. There are two examples of blood covenants actually being taken in the Tanakh. The first one is in Genesis chapter 31. Verses 43 through 55. This is where Yaakov, Jacob, takes a blood covenant with Lavan, Laban. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, 
and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne? Now therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his brothers, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. And Laban called it, uh, I wish I had the Hebrew in front of me, uh, Yigar Sahuda, uh, Sahuduta. But Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, The heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name was called Galid. So uh, Mizpah, because he said, May Yahweh watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. If you afflict my daughters or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, Here is the heap and here is the pillar which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brothers to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. So here Jacob and Laban enter into a blood covenant together. As a result, they become members of each other's house. An even better example occurs in 1 Samuel chapter 18. The first four verses. And it was so, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So what happens here is that Jonathan and David make a blood covenant together. And it says that Saul wouldn't let him go home anymore. It wasn't because Saul was holding him prisoner. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense that he becomes Jonathan's best friend, so Saul holds him prisoner, but rather, he had become a member of the king's house. He ate at the king's table. In fact, in chapter 20, we won't read it, but in chapter 20, the new moon uh, feast comes up, and David talks about how surprised Saul would be if he didn't show up. But Saul hated David. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me back up. There are three customs that are found in the scripture surrounding the making of a blood covenant. I've looked far and wide for halakha on the making of a blood covenant. It's not in the Mishnah. It's not anywhere. It had fallen out of practice before any of the oral law sources that we have were written, unfortunately. In fact, this is the last blood covenant you see made in the Tanakh, as far as I know. The first custom was what we just read about in 1 Samuel 18, 4. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. So David and Jonathan exchanged garments, they exchanged armor, they exchanged swords. Now isn't that interesting? You know, last week we talked about how we put on the full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6. I barely touched on this last week because it wasn't the topic. But in Ephesians chapter 6, 
We have the famous passage about the full armor of God where we are told to put on the full armor of God, the, the belt of truth, uh, and so on down the line, and the sword. So we exchange garments with God. We put on his armor, we take his sword. Fits very well with the idea of, of a blood covenant. Number two, there would be a blood sacrifice. Genesis chapter 31, we read about that with uh, Jacob. They made a sacrifice together on, uh, at the heap. Look also at Jeremiah chapter 34. Verses 18 through 19. And I will give the man, the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. The princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. The making of a blood covenant involved a very special sacrificial ceremony in which an animal was cut in two. And the men taking the covenant would pass together between the parts of the, the, the two halves of the animal as part of the ceremony of making a covenant together. Finally, back to Genesis chapter 31, verse 54. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain, and they called the brothers to eat bread. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. There was a eating of a memorial covenant meal. In fact, the taking of blood covenants is still practiced by the Bedouins and uh, uh, some of the people, uh, the Assyrians, still living in the Middle East. And they still carry on the practices that we're talking about. They still... Uh, uh, do in fact have the covenant meal, which is usually, by the way, uh, bre uh, consists of bread and wine. Now, by comparison, of course, Paul talks about the idea of we also have a blood sacrifice as part of this covenant, and we have a memorial meal. What's that memorial meal? Passover, Pesach, Exodus chapter 12. It is a me memorial meal tied directly to the covenant. And then... Yeshua, when he celebrates Passover, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29, he holds up the cup and he says, this is the cup of the blood of the new covenant, or the renewed covenant, in my blood. Now remember, then he says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So we do it every week, right? Or every month? No. If you read up above that, he says, they were celebrating, they were observing the Passover, dot, 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 as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. This is Pesach, Passover. Go back to Exodus 12, you do it once a year. So they were observing the Passover Seder, and basically he was saying, as often as you observe the Passover Seder, do so in remembrance of me. So we have a covenant meal. This is why at Qumran, by the way, they had this, this whole concept. They believed they were in the new covenant or renewed covenant then. Uh, the way they entered the new covenant in their system was that you, it was pretty simple. When you joined the community, you took an oath, a covenant, to observe the Torah and therefore renewed the covenant and became part of the renewed covenant people in their understanding. And they had a covenant meal that they had, a ritual meal. Now, there's some beautiful allegory that comes to us from the Tanakh in that, that Paul seems to be pointing us back to in these misunderstood passages. And you completely miss this if you take it to be a last will and testament. First of all, how did David become king of Israel? Prophet Shmuel, Samuel, comes and anoints him to be king of Israel. Uh, the scripture doesn't say this, I don't believe, but I think uh, David probably at the time was saying, how could I ever become king of Israel? I'm not even of the same tribe as Saul. How could I ever become king of Israel? I'm not even 
I'm the least of my father's sons, and I'm just nowhere near being in line. There's no way I could ever become king of Israel. And I'll bet the day that he took that blood covenant with Jonathan, it probably rang a bell for him, and he probably said, oh, I just realized <laughs> this is how it's going to happen. David wasn't going to usurp the throne. He had no intentions of taking the throne. He had two opportunities to kill Saul. And instead, on one of those occasions, he, tore up, he, he took a piece of his skirt, ripped, you know, removed it, took it out and held it up and said, See, I have no, no intention of harming you. I could have killed you. Your life was in my hand. So why would he uh, so, be so clear about not touching the Lord's anointed king, Saul, and then go usurp the kingship after Saul's death? doesn't make sense. What happened was, David was legitimate heir to the throne. David had made a blood covenant with Jonathan, and then we read at the end of 1 Samuel and the beginning of 2 Samuel, that on the same day, David, I mean, Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle. Well, Saul's being killed in battle was questionable, but he was killed. He died. And Jonathan died. And what happened when that occurred is that Jonathan's covenant, blood covenant brother became next heir to the throne because Jonathan's son was only four years old at the time. He, there was no way that four-year-old, uh, Jonathan's four-year-old son was going to be uh, serving as king of Israel. So David, quite naturally, in fact, he wasn't even sure. He consulted with the Lord before doing it. And then David went up to, uh, to take the throne. Now here's the concept of inheritance in a blood covenant. It's exactly what Paul is talking about. Now note the parallel here. We have an inheritance because we have a covenant with the son of the king. When the son of the king died, we inherited. This is a lot different from the idea you sometimes think of, uh, of Yeshua as a, you know, there's this... Uh, school of thought that likes to come, you know, come in and say, well, this death of Yeshua kind of thing kind of bothers me because it's a, uh, uh, a human sacrifice. Well, Yeshua was going to die. I, personally, I don't think it would have mattered how he died or when he died. When he died, we had an inheritance. So, we inherit in exactly the same way through blood covenant. Now, another good allegory that we can find in the Tanakh on this concept of a covenant is in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 through 17, I believe. Yes. Now, any allegory breaks down if you take it too far, and this one certainly does, because the allegory that we've already been following has Saul playing the part of God. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 1, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, David's son, delighted much... I'm sorry, uh, Saul's son delighted much in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father... Saul seeks to kill you. My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Now Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been good toward you. For he took his life, he took, uh, for he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and, J and Jonathan told him all these things. 
So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. Now, the beautiful parallel here is that because David had a covenant with Jonathan, Jonathan went before the king on his behalf and pleaded and mediated on his behalf and won favor with the king on his behalf and then goes and gets, John, gets David and brings him into the king's presence and, and renews his relationship with the king so that, that they dwell again together as they had in the past. I think we can see the obvious parallel here in, in, in allegory in our, co in, in our covenant. The final allegory that we have is perhaps even more beautiful. We talked before about Jonathan's son. Now, whenever you took a blood covenant, it affected those that hadn't even been born yet. And so Jonathan had a son after the covenant was made. And that son's name was the hardest name in the world to pronounce. <laughs> Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. And uh, Mephibosheth had been brought up in the house of Saul. And he had been brought up his whole life hearing the lie that, Saul, that David wanted them all dead. David had no harm, harmful intentions towards Saul. He could have killed him twice over and didn't. But the whole talk in the house of Saul was, David wants us all dead. If he ever has the opportunity, he'll have us all killed. And so what did they do as soon as they found out that Saul and Jonathan had been killed on the battlefield. They knew David was going to come. And so they fled out of fear for their lives because they, they'd been lied to their whole life. They'd been brought up to believe from day one that there was nothing good for them going to come from David. So David comes in, you know, and everybody's already gone. And the sad thing is the nurse grabbed Mephibosheth to get him out she forgot about him at first, and then she, oh, my, my goodness, I forgot Mephibosheth, the prince. He's the rightful heir, you know, when he's old enough. So she goes back and she gets him, and she's in such a hurry to get out. She trips and she falls, and Mephibosheth falls, and perhaps he fell off some stairs or something, but both of his legs were broken, and they didn't have the medical practice we have then, plus there wasn't a lot of opportunity because they were fleeing. Um, Mephibosheth was lame for the rest of his life. He never walked again. All because they were buying into this lie. And then, after some time, we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9. By the way, David loved Saul, despite the fact that Saul didn't care too much for him. When he found out that the, the guy that the guy that came to him to tell him about Saul's death when David inquired and the guy lied and said that he killed Saul and he did that because he thought well David's going to like me if I killed Saul so he told this story about how Saul he ended Saul's life to put him out of his misery and David had him executed immediately he said how dare you touch the Lord's anointed alright 2 Samuel chapter 9 now David said is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I must show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Interestingly, it's not scripture, but Josephus, in his, exact, his account of this same material, he says, David recalled the covenant which he had made with Jonathan. So Josephus knew that this had to do with the covenant that had happened. So David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I must show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul who came, whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And the, and the king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the, uh, to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lo-Devar. 
Then King David sent and brought him to the house of Machir, the son uh, out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodavar. Now when Mephibosheth, the, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you sh should look upon me with I am such a dead dog? Now what happened here, I'm sure the Mephibosheth, he was out living in the, in the wilderness somewhere in hiding, hoping that David would never, ever, ever find him, having no idea that, in fact, he already had a covenant with the king and had a place waiting for him at the king's table, and he was out living in the wilderness, hiding, because he had been told his whole life that this guy, David, hates our whole, our whole house. Does, he'd have us all killed. There's nothing good going to come to us from this guy. And it, actually, the opposite was true. There was just a place waiting for him. I'm sure David's soldiers show up to come pick up Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth looks out and sees these guys. He was probably scared to death. I can just see him coming out and say, okay, I'm ready to go ahead and go see David and die like a man. And interestingly, the name of the place that he was hiding was called Lo Devar. Now, if you read that in the Hebrew, I haven't gone back to look what the Hebrew is, but I'm sure without the vowels, at least, it means not the word. <laughs> and so... He gets brought before David and he falls on his face in fear. And he's expecting this to be his last few minutes. And David says, no, no, I have a place prepared for you right here at my table. You're going to spend the rest of your life with servants and being taken care of. And uh, uh, I'm going to give you all the, the lands of your, uh, uh, that, were, that were yours by inheritance. So there's a beautiful allegory there also. Now let's go back and look at this passage in context. When I say this passage, I'm going all the way back to the beginning, not Genesis 1.1. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 through 17, our misunderstood passage. Now, we've already figured out the beauty of what's being talked about here. It has nothing to do with the last will and testament, but it has to do with something very significant to the Hebrew mindset from the Tanakh. When Paul said these words to the student of Tanakh in his time period, it rang bells. They were thinking, oh, okay, exchange of garments, blood sacrifice, covenant meal, right off the bat. They were also thinking right off the bat, oh yeah, so this is like how, how David inherited the kingship because he had a covenant with the son of the king. And they were probably also thinking, you know, of all these allegories, oh, and isn't that interesting? The son of the king went before the throne of the king and petitioned on, his behalf, on, 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 on David's behalf. And they probably also recall the story of how Mephibosheth had been lied to his whole life and not believed that he had a covenant relationship waiting for him. And he, he was hiding and, and, and living in desperation when, in fact, he had this, uh, uh, a place at the king's table waiting for him all along. Now, this section of Hebrews that Paul gives is the whole book of Hebrews is a commentary on Psalm 110. And it is a, a commentary on Psalm 110 which um, ties the whole idea in with inheritance. You know, Paul, when he was on the road to uh, Damascus and he had his vision, he was told 
that his mission was to teach about the inheritance. Let's see if I can find that passage here. I didn't write it down in my notes. Unfortunately, there's three places where that vision is given and that uh, Damascus experiences relate in Acts. Only one of them gives that information. I wish I had it. Well, at any rate, Paul was told that he, his, uh, his teaching was going to deal with inheritance. And his writings are full of inheritance terminology. Covenant is inheritance terminology. Firstborn is inheritance terminology. First fruits is inheritance terminology because first fruits and firstborn are the same word in Hebrew. Bikarim, or bikar, singular, bikarim, plural. The, the words firstborn and first fruits are the same word. Paul talks about inheritance throughout the book of Hebrews. He kind of lays out his argument. And this is the climax of his argument because at the beginning of chapter 8 of Hebrews, Paul says, This is the main point of the things we are saying. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you starting with chapter 8, every, the, the whole argument he's building through the book of Hebrews, he launches into it. And the book of Hebrews is the one book which lays out his inheritance argument from top to bottom all the way through as a commentary to Psalm 110. Um, I wish we could go through the whole book of Hebrews. We probably will one day. I've got a commentary on Hebrews, by the way, uh, that goes through all of that. But chapter 8... Beginning in chapter 8 of Hebrews, Paul starts a little midrash in which he compares a couple of passages. And then the Psalm, uh, there's uh, Jeremiah 31, which deals with the New Covenant. Now, in Psalm 110, David sees something interesting. He ties Psalm 110 to Yom Kippur because... What happens in Psalm 110, this is the Lord said to my Lord, come and sit at my right hand, and this is where it talks about Melchizedek and whatnot. And Paul says, aha, the priest Melchizedek is at the right hand of God, therefore he's in the Holy of Holies. And since that only happens at Yom Kippur, he figures Psalm 110 deals with Yom Kippur in some aspect. And so, he go, and so he goes in chapter 8 to talk about, beginning in chapter 8, to talk about the Yom Kippur ceremony, which is found in Leviticus 16. The Yom Kippur ceremony is found in Leviticus 16. There are two goats chosen. One is chosen for Yahweh, and the other is chosen and, uh, for Azazel, which was in ancient Israel a, 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 essentially a wilderness demon. And the two goats, the high priest would kill the first goat, the goat dedicated to Yahweh. He would kill it. And he would take its blood, and he would go into the Holy of Holies. And this is the only time he would ever go into the Holy of Holies uh, in the entire ever. And it was a very serious thing when he did go into the Holy of Holies, because if he screwed up, that was it. They would tie, they would literally, they would tie a cord around his ankle. And it would put bells on his garments so they could hear him moving. And if those bells, they could tell from those bells if he fell over dead. <laughs> and if he did, they, they could pull him out by the cord without having to go in after him. Okay, so it was a very serious thing. Probably one of the most serious things as far that, you know, that God ever was concerned with was the way the Holy of Holies was treated in this Yom Kippur ceremony, which was the only time in which the Holy of Holies was intruded upon by man. And uh, what took place was he would take blood from the goat and he would sprinkle it on the altar seven times. On the mercy seat, I'm sorry, not the altar. On the mercy seat, on the, on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And, this is, and then he would come out, and according to uh, Leviticus 16, he did this to cleanse the sanctuary from the sin of Israel. And then he would come out and he would place his hands upon the Azazel, the demonic entity, essentially, 
and it would be driven off into the wilderness with the sins of Israel conferred upon it. Now, the allegory here is that uh, Paul presents, it's pretty obvious, that the goat dedicated to Yahweh that's killed is the Messiah. The high priest is the Messiah after that point because the goat's kind of dead. <laughs> so, the, so the high priest represents the resurrected Messiah since it's you know, a little much to expect that the goat would be resurrected. And the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and bring, sprinkles the, the goat's blood seven times. And Paul sees this as the Messiah being the high priest going into the heavenly Holy of Holies because uh, Moshe was told to build the tabernacle after a pattern that was shown to him implying that there's a heavenly Holy of Holies. And in the heavenly Holy of Holies, you have the throne, whereas in the earthly Holy of Holies, you have the, uh, the mercy seat. And in the earthly Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant, the Tablets of the Covenant, all symbols of the covenant, i.e. the Mosaic Covenant, the first covenant. Okay? Not the, re the, the real first covenant, but the first covenant in what Paul is talking about. And then you go up to uh, the heavenly Holy of Holies, and you have the renewed covenant inside okay now there is a parallel that you won't find in any commentary I've ever seen but it's an obvious obvious parallel when you start looking into this and that is between Hebrews chapter 8 and 9 and Revelations chapter 5 in both cases you have the same picture you have the Messiah in the heavenly holy of holies at the right hand of the throne, doing something because of his blood. Now, in chapter, Hebrews chapter 8, he's becoming mediator of the new covenant. Okay, or the renewed covenant, more correctly. Brit Hadashah uh, could mean new covenant, but more likely means renewed covenant. And so, uh, um, he goes into the uh, uh, heavenly holy of holies in both cases, and in both cases, he's at the right hand of the Father, and he's doing something because of his blood. Hebrews chapter 8, he's becoming mediator of the new covenant. In Revelation chapter 5, he's opening a sealed book. In both cases, we're told he's able to do this because of the blood. And he's doing both things exactly the same spot, at the right hand of the throne. Revelation 5.1 says that the, the sealed book was held in the right hand. Okay? Now, I submit to you, based upon that initially, that becoming of the mediator of the new covenant is the same thing as opening the sealed book. Now, notice that the book that's sealed is sealed with seven seals, and the Messiah is able to remove the seven seals because of his blood. Okay? Now, notice that the high priest goes into the heavenly holy of holies and goes to the same spot, to the mercy seat, and deposits the blood seven times. So the, the high priest does something with the blood at the mercy seat seven times. The Messiah does something at the throne with the blood seven times. And what he does causes him to become mediator of the new covenant or the renewed covenant. So we have this seven-sealed book in Revelations, chapters 5 and 6. And if you go look at the, what the seven seals are, what are the seals on a book? They are things that prevent the book from being opened. I think this verse may well be misunderstood. It's chapter 22, verse 12. It says, that, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Now, what is his reward? It doesn't say your reward. He says, my reward. Well, his reward in the book of Revelations was this sealed book. It was, he was, it, uh, Revelation chapter 5, he was found to be worthy, the only one worthy of this book. It was his reward. So when he comes back with the new covenant, he makes the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and so on. So this is what the renewed covenant is. It has to do, now you know, three great secrets, I guess. One, why did the Messiah have to die? You've heard that one over and over again. Uh, how is this, a, how, how can a, human sacrifice to be in any way acceptable? How does that work? Why did the Messiah keep the Torah 
completely. Why was that necessary for the Messiah to come and keep the Torah completely and die? Well, the answer is he had to keep the Torah completely in order to be a fair judge that he would be able to go into the heavenly holy of holies, get the sealed book, pass those judgments, remove the seven seals, and open up the book. In fact, this ties us back to the New Covenant again. Let's go look at Jeremiah 31. We read about the New Covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 37. And by the way, when you read this material, it becomes clear the New Covenant has not, in full effect, come into existence yet. Because when the New Covenant comes, will not say every man to his brother, know God, for they shall all know him. Is that true? Has that happened? No. That's why Yeshua said I wouldn't partake, he wouldn't partake of the cup of the New Covenant with until his return. Okay. So chapter 31, verses 31 through 37, we have the New Covenant. And then, in chapter 32, verses 40 through 44, we again return to the subject of the New Covenant. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, blah, 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 blah. It goes right back into the New Covenant again. Now, sandwiched in between these passages is something very interesting. Jeremiah 32, verse 11. In fact, let's back up to verse... Let's see, where do I want to start here? Verse 6. Now remember, this is nestled right in between the New Covenant and the New Covenant. And Jeremiah said, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is in Anatot, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of Yahweh, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anatot, which is in the country of Benjamin, Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself, and the redemption, uh, uh, buy it for yourself, then I knew that this was the word of Yahweh. So I brought the f bought the field from Hanamiel, the son of my uncle, who was in Anatote, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the sefer, the deed, but the word there in the Hebrew is sefer, and sealed it, took witnesses and weighed the money in the balances. So I took the sefer, both that which was sealed according to the Torah and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the sefer to Baruch, the son of... Now realize the word sefer in Hebrew, I, I'm, I'm uh, assuming too much here. Uh, the word sefer in Hebrew literally means book or record, but it's translated here deed. And I gave the sefer to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Mahasiah, in the presence of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed, or sefer, before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Then I charged Baruch before him, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these sefarim, both this purchase sefer, which is sealed, and this seafair which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Now what the concept here is that the uh, Babylonians had come in and taken over. They were running the show outside of the walls of Jerusalem. They were under siege at this time. Jeremiah was in prison. He was in prison, by the way, because he kept telling the king that he needed to surrender to Babylon, uh, to the Babylonians. And the king uh, didn't want to hear it because he was more interested in an alliance with the Egyptians. <clears throat> so, uh, at, any, uh, at any rate, Jeremiah here, the, the, pro this, the prophetic meaning of this is that they were not in control of their lands. 
And so it was really risky business and pretty much stupid to buy any of this land because you weren't going to end up with it. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was going to end up with it. And so what he said was, take this, seal it up, put it in an earthen vessel. You know what an earthen vessel is. They found a whole bunch of them at Qumran. <laughs> okay? Put it in an earthen vessel and hide it away because someday we're going to own this land again. Okay? So the hint is that when this sealed sefer, sealed book or deed, is opened at a time when Israel regains all of its land and all of its inheritance. That hasn't happened yet. I mean, the little tiny bit of land that's over there now, smaller than New Jersey, is not the land, all of it, that was promised. So, back to Paul. So, Paul is saying here that the Messiah goes into the heavenly holy of holies and he becomes mediator of the new covenant or the renewed covenant. And I think we've got a lot of insight now into what that really means and what it entailed. He redeems the title deed of Israel, essentially. And he comes back out and he renews the covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. <clears throat> and as a result of this covenant relationship we have with the Messiah, the son of the king, we have an advocate before the king's throne. We have an inheritance from the house of the king. And finally, we have a situation in today in which many people have believed the lie and don't believe and haven't realized that they have a place at the king's table and an inheritance waiting for them. You have been listening to one of the many tape messages from Dr. James Trim of the Society for the Advancement of Nazarene Judaism, the ancient sect of the Nazarenes Restored, P.O. Box 471, Hearst, Texas 76053.